Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Steve Swayze, and on behalf of the Geospatial Information and Technology Association, it is my pleasure to introduce Sheila Wilson, Ph.D. and GISP, and the Executive Director of the GIS Certification Institute. The GISC I, uh, certification program will be the topic of the discussion this afternoon. For those that are joining the presentation today, I would ask two things. First, please ensure that you have muted your uh, telephone or uh, means that you called in through something like Skype. And second of all, um, we've requested that um, you save your questions until the end of Sheila's presentation today. Now on to a quick bio for Sheila. Sheila gained her Ph.D. or earned her Ph.D., I should say, from the University of Tulsa in 2002 and then worked in the pipeline industry for the next five years where she rose to serve as the executive director of the PODS Association Pipeline Open Data Standard. Uh, in 2008, she earned her GISP designation and has since 2009 served as the Executive Director of the GIS Certification Institute. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Sheila, and I would also like to remind you one more time, please ensure for the courtesy of others that are listening in on the presentation that you have, in fact, muted your phone or electronic means of, uh, of calling in. Thank you very much. Sheila, it's all yours. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate that. Um, I've been a member of GITA for about eight years, I believe, so I'm, I'm honored to be participating in this webinar. What I'm going to talk about is um, getting your GISP and sort of giving some history on the GIS Certification Institute and what we do and why we do it. So first of all, um, I call the GIS Certification Institute, GISCI, we have five member organizations, which are listed here, along with the, the dates in which they joined. We were started as a, as a committee, <coughs> excuse me, a certification committee with ERISA. And a group of people developed the certification program and then invited others to join. And over the years, people have, or organizations have joined. Each of these member organizations provide people to our board of directors. So we're governed by these by our member organizations through the Board of Directors. GISCI um, is a 501c6 organization, which means we're a nonprofit trade association. We provide the GIS industry with a complete mechanism for certification in GIS. And it's important to note that while our members appoint people to the Board of Directors, According to U.S. law and the IRS, we're completely separate from our member organizations. We've also been in service for 10 years this year. Our first group or cohort of, of applicants or of GICs were approved in October of this year, of 2003, sorry, so exactly 10 years ago. The mission of GISCI is to maintain the high standards and integrity of the GIS profession and to promote ethical conduct within it. And so the point of having the GISP is really to maintain those high standards. It's voluntary, and I'll go into that in more detail as we go forward, but really to promote that ethical conduct. In our code of ethics, here's kind of an overview, but we have an obligation to society, to employers, to colleagues, and then to individuals in society. And one of the big things that we do is to respect privacy and respect the individuals. And we all know within the GIS industry, there's, um, that can be difficult at times, and there's lots of um, debate about the best way to do that. And so we, as part of our code of ethics, we ask people to really be aware of that and be considerate of the privacy of individuals. Next is terminology. So this is just a quick a quick slide to sort of get us all on the same page. Certification, which is what we do, is a voluntary evaluation and acknowledgement of skills in a profession. It's different than licensure. Licensure is a legal regulation, so we don't do licensure. It's different than accreditation. Accreditation has to do with evaluating training materials and standards for programs. Um, it's typically used for colleges and universities, so we don't do accreditation. What we do is the GISP certification, 
which is a peer review examination of one's qualifications. So certification and licensure are two different but amicable methods of recognizing skills and practice. Next is the GIS, um, certi sorry, the GISP certification. It is voluntary. It's for GIS prof professionals and any specialty. So we have people from different walks in their career. For example, I came from the pipeline industry. A lot of planners do, um, a lot of planners have become GISP certified. The system is self-documented and it's point-based. As I said, it's peer-reviewed, and I'll go into that in more detail later. And it's a recognition of achievement, of what we've done and how we've done it. And it is self-regulated. We have um, an ethics, um, as I mentioned, you have to sign the ethics, and an ethics agreement or code of conduct. And if there's an issue, then that is, can be brought to the GIS Verification Institute and ethics issues are investigated. And once um, we have had ethics violations brought to our attention and have dealt with them, that's one of the questions we often have is, it, has it happened? And yes, it has. It's a difficult situation, but, but we work through it. We have an ethics committee who does that. So next, why certify? So for you, as an individual, why should you certify? Um, you should certify because the GISP certification has value to, to you. So where do you find that value? You have to look at why it's important to you. How does it benefit you as a professional? Does it increase your recognition? Does it support and recognize your contributions? Will it add to your career? And will it help in your employment? So the GISP has been around for about 10 years. And Ten years ago, the answer to will it add value to your career or help in your employment was, well, you know, no, it's brand new. Probably not. What I have seen um, over the last three years that I've been the executive director is that the impact of the GISP is growing. I have people, um, we regularly have people who send in their application who want to have it reviewed quickly so that they can have the GISP on their resume because they're applying for a job or because a job is requiring the GISP or the GISP is requested. We're also getting a lot of requests because um, contractors or um, vendors are being requested to have GISPs on staff or maybe there's an RFP or an RFP going out requesting GISPs. So that's increasing significantly. And it depends on the areas of the country. Different areas of the country have, um, have uh, it's more recognized than others. In the end, um, this is going to sound interesting, but when I when I decided to get my GISP, my thought was, well, it couldn't hurt. So I went ahead and got it, and in fact, it has benefited my career to a great degree. It has led to a better job, better pay, and I know of um, thousands of people that can say the same. So why certify? within the GIS industry. Why is this important to the industry? So it provides added value to the profession. There was an article last summer in ARC News by David DiBiase who listed seven things that we can do to strengthen the GIS industry. And the number one thing he said was to get our GISP. Because what it does is it does strengthen the industry. It makes it easier for people to know what we do. It helps with HR. And as, as you look through the list, you know, it talks about ensuring a core competency of ethics, experience, education, and contribution. It provides recognition. It supports employment and business needs. So this is important for people who are responding to an RFP or an RFQ. It makes it really simple for HR. When people don't know what GIS is, if you say that you're looking, you want to hire someone and you're looking for a GISP, it makes it real easy for them just to look for that GISP. And it saves time and it saves money. And in this market, when we get a 1,000 applications for one job, it's important to save that time, save that money, and have a way of finding the right person. Um, it also helps support the educational development for current and prospective GIS professionals. So it's important 
to share that with your employer. I have my PISP and I need to get the education requirements. And it makes it simpler to justify. It also encourages long-term professional development. The foundation of the GISD is built on ethics, education, experience, contributions, and we have an exam coming that I'll talk about in more detail. So as we look at the certification requirements, um, for the ethics, you have to sign the, the ethics, the rules of conduct and code of, the ethics code. For the education, um, let me back up a second. The whole certification requirement is point-based. And so you have to reach a minimum number of points in each category and then a minimum total requirement. And so being point-based, it gives us a quantitative way to um, to really look at more of a qualitative um, a qualitative review of a person's career. So for education, you have to have 30 points. For experience, you have to have 60 points. But you also have to have a minimum of four years' work experience in GIS. You also have to have eight points in the contribution um, to the profession section. Then you need another 52 points from any of the three categories. So, so just to give a simple example of this profile, in the education section, where you're required to have 30 points, if you have a bachelor's degree, um, a bachelor's degree in any field will give you 20 points. So that means you need 10 more points from anywhere. You can get those um, from three GIS-related college courses. A 10 credit hour, 10 credit hours is worth approximately 10 points. So 10 credits would give you um, the extra 10 points, or 40 continuing education units, or 100 days of event attendance, and this is things like conferences or workshops, things like that. So for the work experience, um, it's broken down into tiers depending on the level of work you do. And again, you have to have that minimum of four years full-time experience. It takes a lot of people um, six to eight years to get all of the points that they need. So I, I generally recommend people not to expect to get it after four years. You could. It's not impossible. But, you know, you should expect it to take a little longer. This is a professional certification, and it takes time to become a professional. In the contributions to the profession section, um, this is where you really want to participate and get involved. And so you could have eight years of membership or have four years on a committee or have two years on a board, and that would get you the points. You can do volunteer work. You can write papers. There's a whole long list of things that you can do in the application itself. So for the applicant review process, you, um, when we receive the application, then we send an email notifying you that we've received it. And then the application is sent to reviewers. Now, I've got a couple bullets here. On the applicant review committee, in order for people to join that, they have to sign a code of conduct for the applicant review committee. And they're required to keep um, personal information personal and private and, and um, absolutely confidential. Reviewers are not allowed to review someone they know. They can only review people they don't know. If they know the person, they're required to notify us so that we can reassign it to someone who doesn't know them. And that's to, you know, prevent any bias. We also, um, if they'll oftentimes print the application and they're required to destroy that, you know, shred it once they're done reviewing it in order to keep that information confidential. Um, oftentimes we get information that's missing or we may need more information. And when that happens, we contact the applicant. So that's one of the big questions that we get. What happens if I send my application in and I don't have enough information on there? Are you just gonna, are you just gonna say no and, and I lose my money, I lose everything? And the answer is no. What we'll do is we'll really look it over. We'll figure out what you need and we'll work with you to, to, um, help you get the points or get the documentation or get whatever's missing that you need. And then upon approval, an applicant will receive a certification number with a certificate and renewal information. <clears throat> and then GISPs are listed on the website in a searchable GISP manifest. We'll also send a letter to your employer if you would like, recognizing that you've received the GISP along with some information um, to your employer saying that, you know, you will need to, to do some continuing education in order to 
get your GISP, and you have five years to do that. Some common issues with the initial application is we get a lot of military personnel who apply. And a lot of them have been doing things that are classified. And so we work with military personnel to evaluate their application. We have people in the military who are GISPs who can look over the applications and um, sort of read between the lines or, or contact the people they need to contact to verify that the information is true. Sometimes there's some point pressure based on the differences in the tiers between the between the tiers and the professional experience section. And some people will underestimate what they do in terms of the tiers, and some people will overestimate what they do. And so we have to find a way to balance that out. And always with these, we're able to help answer questions at any time. Next is the calculation of the supervisory bonus. Um, that's miscalculated sometimes. So what we do is we um, contact contact the applicant and work through what it needs to be and, and get the right numbers in there. And then calculating the student activity hours for universities that don't use the traditional credit hour system. So the credit hour system is given as the example in the manual itself. And what we do is um, if someone doesn't come from a university that uses that traditional credit hour, we help them determine what the equivalent would be for a traditional credit hour system so they can come up with the correct student activity hours. Some other common issues are over-documenting the points. So you'll remember back a couple of uh, two or three slides, you need 150 points total. I've had people submit applications with 900 or 1,000 points, and that's really not necessary. Because what we've done is we've set that benchmark, that minimum required. And so what we ask people is, um, you know, if, if you're getting to 200 or 250 points, you don't have to keep adding more points. This isn't intended to be an exhaustive review of your career, but rather enough points to show that you qualify for the GIST and that it will be awarded to you. So just meet the minimums and go a little bit over, and then go ahead and send it in from there. And then understanding the contributions to the profession section, determining the differences between work-related activities and contributions. And this, this, one, this one can be a little bit tricky. Um, so an example here is I'm giving this presentation on behalf uh, – I was invited by GITA to give this presentation. So it would count as a contribution to the profession because I was invited to do it. Even though I'm being paid, I'm on the job while I do it, I'm being paid to do it um, by my employer, because I was invited to do it, it does count. However, if I were to, if an example would be um, if for an ESRI employee, if an ESRI employee is teaching a class, an ESRI class, that's considered work. But if they go to a conference and give the same class, then even though they're paid by entry to go do it, then it counts as a contribution because they're at a conference and they were invited to do it there. And, you know, there are just different things like this that can be a little confusing. So if you run across something and you're not sure if it counts or not, you can always contact us, and we'll gladly help you help answer questions and help you determine whether or not it counts. And then documenting the contributions to the profession section. At least 50% of the points need to be documented. So in the manual, it says if, if something, if an activity that you've done is worth only one or two points, you don't have to document it. But what we're saying is you need to document at least 50% of, of your activities, no matter what the point value, so we can verify that it's true and accurate. For the renewal, we have a lot of people coming up for a renewal this year. I think we have um, maybe 12 or 1,500 people coming up for renewal over the next over the next 12 months. And so people must earn um, a minimum of 10 points in the in the education section and a minimum of 10 points in the contributions to the profession. Now it's important to note that 
there is no work experience minimum for the renewal. And so sometimes people get laid off or something happens or they've taken leave. You know, some people have been deployed overseas. Some people had children. And they're concerned that they don't meet this work experience minimum. But there's no requirement for that. Just the education and just the contributions to the profession. So for the contributions to the profession, it's a 10-point minimum. And the 10-point minimum is over five years. So I'm going to do a quick out loud math here. You need six hours of education to meet the 10-point, uh, six, sorry, six hours of education per point, which means you need 60 hours of education over five years, which is one hour per month. And this webinar counts as an educational activity. So activities can't be sales related, but any type of webinar that's instructional, um, that promotes the GIS industry, that helps the GIS industry will count in the education section. And then of course conference attendance counts, um, any classes that you take in the university count. The contributions to the profession minimum is 10 points over five years. And you get, when you go to renew, you receive three points for every year that you're a member of a GIS group like GITA or ERISA or a local user group or something like that. So three points per year, you can earn those very quickly. And then you need another 20 points, another 20 points um, in the flex points. And you can get those from education or from contribution or from work experience. So that is where you can count the work experience if you have it. So for renewal certification, I sort of went over this in the last slide, but you need um, one point is equal to six hours of professional development, which is one hour per month over five years. So work experience, you can count 10 points for each 12 months time period, but there's a maximum of, maximum of 20 points. And you'll remember there was only 20 points required for the flex points. And then the contributions to the profession is another 10 points. The renewal for certification applicants, um, for the renewal certification, applicants don't have to submit their documentation. We, you need to keep it on hand in case there's any questions or something, but you don't have to submit the documentation. Now, one of the things I didn't talk about with the initial application is that the initial application takes several hours to complete, okay? When you download the initial application, you download 100 pages, a little more than 100 pages, and it can be intimidating. But when you look at the application itself, you only have to complete about 12 pages. And some of those are as simple as your name and address, your contact information. So all but two or three of the pages are really pretty simple. So when you download those 100 pages, don't let it intimidate you. Now, the good news is, once you've got your GISD certification and you go to do the renewal, you should be able to complete the renewal in an hour or less. Um, I know people have said it, it took them about 20 to 30 minutes. And what, what you learn from the initial application is to keep your documentation handy so you can fill it out and have it ready immediately. You can have it at hand. And so, again, you should be able to fill it out in 30 minutes or less. So some common issues with renewing are a lack of understanding of what is required to renew. So people often think that um, the renewal is going to be as difficult as the initial application, and it's not. It should be quick and easy. Um, some people request exceptions because they don't have enough points. And as a rule, we don't grant exceptions. Now, there are two cases where we do grant, where we have granted exceptions, and that's for people in the military who've been deployed overseas, and also for uh, people who fall under the Family Medical Leave Act. And so people who've had to um, step away from work for those two reasons have been granted exceptions. Um, also, Another common issue is that sometimes people don't realize their certification is last. So when you fill out the initial certification, 
we get your name and address and contact information and email and all of that. And so when the time comes, about a year before you renew, we send out an email telling you that your renewal is due, and then um, we'll send out a letter sometime in that year before, and then the month before your renewal is due, we'll send out a second email. So the problem would be, if we don't have your current contact information, you're not going to get that notice that your certification is due, and so it will lapse. Now, you can go on to the, the GIFCI website, and there's a manifest, and you can look there to see when it, when it, it sorry, when your certification will end. It's a five-year period. You can also, on the same website in the same area, there's a place where you can update your contact information. So if you know you're getting closer, if you've moved or you've changed your email, it would be good to go ahead and, and update your information so that we can let you know when the time comes that you need to leave here. So next, um, looking at GIS as a profession, the Department of Labor has established the Geospatial Technology Competency Model, which is um, the third bullet down, that's the GTCM. The Geospatial Technology Competency Model, which was endorsed by GISCI in 2011, and then the Geospatial Management Competency Model, which was approved in August 20th of 2012. And the Department of Labor is using those two documents to really define the geospatial industry, of which GIS is a part of that. And so GISCI is basing a lot of its standards and things that we do on that GTCM and the GNCM. The standards for the profession are based on the body of knowledge like the GTCM and the GNCM, as well as the GI Science and Technology body of knowledge created by UCGIS. Also, the DATAM was used to create the GTCM and the GNCM. And then there's other standards for GIS specialization as well as other documents that are out there that have helped to build this body of knowledge around the GIS industry. And what this, this is the primary reason why the GIS Certification Institute has made contributions to the profession a part of the application process. Because 10 years ago, the general overall body, know, body of knowledge for the GIS industry was fairly small. And we've worked hard and the GISCs have worked hard to really build up this whole body so that there's a, more information available about what we do and how we do it, best practices, standards, um, et cetera, that we need to make the GIS industry grow and mature and develop and to make all of our lives easier as we use GIS. So through that, in evaluating the profession, there's a quote here that I'll let, I'll let you read. But one of the things that we're looking at in evaluating the profession is um, 10 years ago, an exam for the certification process for the GISP wasn't feasible because this body of knowledge wasn't built up enough. The industry wasn't mature enough to lead to an exam. But what we have done is um, several years ago, the board of directors gave the certification committee the task of developing a core competency working group to determine whether or not an exam should be added to the existing portfolio process. And the core competency working group through the certification committee came back and said that yes, they recommended that an exam be added to the existing portfolio process. So I want to make that very clear that the exam will be in addition to the portfolio. It's not going to replace it, but in addition to it. We had a public comment period in February 2011, and then the Board of Directors reviewed that public comment, reviewed all of the information, reviewed the proposal um, by the Core Competency Working Group, and determined that an exam would be in the best interest of the GIS industry. And so we are taking steps, and we have a planned implement implementation of an exam by 2015. Again, just to overstress it, the exam will be in addition to the portfolio process.
It will not replace it, but be in addition to it. So, changes to the certification. Apparently, my picture pops up on this one. That's interesting. So, the Board of Directors unanimously approved the development of the exam in early 2011. It's expected to be in place by 2015. It will be in addition. This is in case you didn't get it the first three times I said it. Existing GISPs won't be required to take the exam. Now, you remember from my bio, my bio I have a, a PhD, and I've taken a few exams over my lifetime. So I'm, I'm rather excited that I won't have to take the exam. Now, there are people out there who um, are, have their GISP and who are looking forward to taking the exam. I'm just not one of them. I'm thankful that existing GISPs won't have to. So in developing the profession, some things that we're looking into in the foreseeable future are to continue and adopt and, and develop standards related to the GISP as well as the GIS industry as a whole. Um, we expect to continue serving specialized professionals and GIS with and those with GISP designations. We expect to have a certification throughout one's full career. So earlier I mentioned that GTCM and then the geospatial management competency model. So we're looking at what that's going to mean to the GISP to, to have management so that we meet that certification throughout one's career. And then we expect to have exam preparation materials as the exam goes into place. We'll also be turning to our member organizations to help with that. Um, we'll have a revised renewal process. So we're looking at having annual contact instead of every five years because people do change emails, they change jobs, they change addresses. And so in order to really enhance that ability to connect with GISPs. And then also looking at international programs. Um, let me see my next slide here. This is GISPs across the nation. And then in a small inset down in the lower right, you see um, around the world. And what we see is, what we have is, more than 30 countries are represented by the GISP. Most countries only have a few people, um, one or two or three in a country. But we do have, a, there is an international need for it. The GISP was created for the U.S. So we have a lot of people in the U.S. and Canada. We're looking at what that would mean to go with, to go international with the GISP in order to better meet the, in, the needs of the GIS industry beyond the United States borders. So that's it. For more information, you can go to our website. You can also email us, and we'll be glad to help, and then you can call or fax. So with that, I'd like to thank you. And then, Steve, I think you um, had some questions for us. Well, um, Sheila, um, I first of all would like to thank you so much for your superb presentation. And as you have read through the crystal ball, I do. I've got six questions here that have been submitted in advance, and I would appreciate your thoughts on them if you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. How do you, do you begin the process of becoming a GISP? Um, I think we're looking for some thoughts on... Where do you go to get the application and that sort of thing? That is a great question. So to begin the process, you, you go to our website. Right on the front page, um, if you scroll down just a hair, there's a table and it says to get the application. Now, one of the things I said in the presentation is that when you download all of the, new, all of the material available for downloading, it's going to be more than 100 pages, and it can be very intimidating. So don't let it. If you get stuck on a page or you get stuck somewhere, call us or email us. We'll be glad to walk you through a page. It really, really goes fairly quick and easy. Some things that you need to begin that process is you'll need original transcripts from the colleges or universities that you've attended. You'll need a letter from your employer verifying the work that you do and, well, verifying your professional experience. There's a template in there for that letter. And I took the letter, um, when I got my GISP, I typed it up and sent it to my supervisor and asked him to adjust it as necessary and, and sign it. And so it made it easier for him by taking that step. And then, of course, tracking down contributions. One of the ways I tell people 
you know, if you have contributions but you don't really remember what they are, do an Internet search on your name and see what you find. Because you can find all kinds of, of GIS um, of, of contributions that you've made over time. Um, Sheila, here's one from somebody that's thinking ahead. The question is, I'm uh, new to GIS and I don't qualify for the GISP. What recommendations do you have for me? Well, this goes back a little bit to the last question. Look at the application, figure out what it's going to take, and then plan accordingly. So one of the biggest problems that people have, particularly those who have been in the industry for a while, is they don't keep documentation of their contributions. And so since you're just starting out, if you hold on to that documentation, if you know what you need, then you can, first of all, get those contributions, and you can hold on to the documentation so that you have it ready when you're ready to submit. I think you probably would indicate that that would be a trick or a uh, way to streamline your approach in the future. Is that is that your thinking on that one? Yes, definitely. Okay. Okay, under the next question is, um, what is required, and we've talked quite a, little, quite a bit about this, but I'm, just one more time, what's required to renew the GISP certification? All right, so to renew, you need education and contributions to the profession. So work experience isn't required. And if you're just starting out on the renewal process, then it's good to remember that one hour per month over 60 months will get you all the points that you need to meet the minimum. If you attend a conference, um, let's say you attend a week-long conference, that's five days, eight hours a day, that's 40 hours of conference attendance. And you, if you receive six, you receive one point for every six hours. So a 40-hour week conference is worth about, I got lost on the math there, but worth about 6.67 points for one week. So you can also get your points from that direction. And you can earn them fairly quickly, even from, from day-long conferences. I have a conference in my state that's a day or two, and I can go there and earn quite a few points that way. Sheila, following through on something I think that uh, you've touched on also in the presentation, but just as a reminder, there's a lot of folks thinking about the thought that the original application took a long time to complete. How long is the renewal going to take? It does take a long time to do that first one. It took me a while, I can tell you that, so I give people lots of sympathy because I've done it. My renewal is due this October, and I should be able to complete it, like I said, in less than an hour. Maybe I could probably do it in 30 minutes just using a pen and paper. And then when those items come forward, who reviews the GISP application? And is it the same for renewals? Yes, that's a great question. We have um, we have a review committee that has about 110 people on it. So each application is generally reviewed by several people, and the members of those committees are all of, of that committee are all GISPs. They've all signed that code of conduct that I had mentioned that says, you know, keep all the information confidential and also um, not to review someone that they know. And I had mentioned that confidential part. One of the things that we say in the manual is to, when you send in your application, if something has your Social Security number or some other specific identifying information that you don't want to share, take a, mar a sharpie and black it out. It's okay to... to to black it out. We don't need that information. What we need is the information that shows that you have your GISP. All right. Thank you. And I think the last one that we'll want to hit here, Sheila, is um, by what authority does the GIS Certification Institute have to award the GISP certification? That's a great question. So our authority comes from the um, five member organizations. So we have the five member organizations who um, who oversee the board of directors, but they've also given us the authority by which we do the certification process. And I did note see that some um, some questions came across. 
Well, I would would you please like to take a couple of those? Um, please, by all means. I don't know how. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I'm an uh, expert, but I don't know how to do this one. <laughs> yeah, and unfortunately, I'm uh, I'm looking to see. Did they come in via the chat? Um. Well, we can un we can unmute everyone and see if uh, we've got somebody from the crowd that would like to chime in. Good idea. All right, so I have a question. Are there any changes planned for the application materials or process in the coming year? So the question is, if you download and compress the material now but don't complete it for six months, which ha six months, which happens? It takes, you know, it can take some time to fill it out. Especially if you wait for documentation, is it likely that you'll have a new set of documents or new requirements? So no, we're not expecting any changes to the application materials in 2013. So you can go ahead and, and print it now. Now the recommendation that I have, I was a major procrastinator when I did it. So my recommendation is figure out those 12 pages or so that you need to um, that you need to fill out and and set aside some time and just fill it out and get it done. Otherwise, it can take you, I know people that have taken them three or four or five years to get it filled out. So I recommend that you try not to procrastinate. So one thing you do want to do is look at getting the application done before the exam unless you just want to take the exam. And then you'll have to have the portfolio plus the exam. All right, so that's the only question I know how to see, Steve. Okay, um, Sheila, if you can still hear me, I don't know if I've uh, been made live again, but um, I, I would uh, would like to ask you: Is there are there any last thoughts that you'd like to contribute at this point, and we'll wrap things up from here? You know, the the one thing that I would really like to share is that we will help you with the application. If you get stuck or need help or have questions or are not sure about something, contact us. Contact us um, on our website. There's a you can email us at that info at gisci.org. There's a, there's a form you can fill out on the website. If you forget this, you can um, send it in that way. We're easy to reach. You can call us anytime. And we'll be glad to help answer your questions and help you with the process. Okay. Um, with that, Sheila, thank you so much um, for your superb presentation. And I would just like to point out that both this uh, recorded uh, webinar and plus additional questions that um, have been provided uh, will be with answers will be posted up uh, on the GITA website and please look forward for additional GITA sponsored education presentations going forward and thanks again signing off on March 26, 2013. Good day. Thank you.